factors of the resource persons about the advantages and uh, uh, possibilities of space sciences. Uh, but we must have also realized uh, how small we are in terms of uh, how much we have achieved so far. This realization only will help us to scale a greater heights. Uh, today we have a very distinguished personality as our uh, resource person, Dr. Veena Vies, uh, who will speak on the topic, star formation in the Milky Way, an observer's guide. Her academic profile is very big. Let me introduce it to you in a few words. Uh, Dr. Veena is at present a Humboldt Fellow in the Institute of Physics in the University of Cologne, Germany, engaged in her postdoctoral research activities. After completing MSc in Physics from IIT Madras in 2012, she went on to do her PhD from the IIST. She completed her PhD in 2018 on the topic Infrared Dark Clouds to Star Clusters in-depth study on structure, evolution, and the kinematics of a few southern massive star-forming regions. Her major research interests are in topics like large-scale structure of the Milky Way, massive star formation, galactic center, and so on. She has won numerous awards, including K.D. Abhengar Award by Astronomical Society of India, for the best thesis presentation. She has numerous publications to her credit and has presented papers in various public forums. She has also been a referee of the Astrophysical Journal since 2020. On behalf of everyone present here, let me extend to you a very warm welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, our HOD, uh, Dr. Sheila Mary takes uh, adequate measures to ensure that uh, we have several academic and extracurricular activities uh, in our department to keep, keep us updated uh, in the ever-changing world of science. Um, I would like to extend you, Sheena, ma'am, a very hearty welcome to the session. Thank you, sir. Um, then the mastermind behind this program is the uh, organizing secretary, Dr. Sachin. The efforts he took to coordinate this program is praiseworthy. Let me wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Sachin to this invited talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, even though we are all uh, part of the uh, family of the Department of Physics, I would like to formally welcome uh, all my uh, dear colleagues to this program. And finally, uh, it's a great pleasure in welcoming you, young and energetic students, who are the most important beneficiaries of this Space Week webinar series. Welcome one and all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm overjoyed to take the opportunity to invite a resource person of the day. She worked for her PhD in Department of Earth and Space Sciences and has successfully defended her PhD thesis in astronomy and astrophysics. She has been awarded the Humboldt Research Fellowship and also the K.D. Abhengar Best Thesis Award in 2018. She is currently doing her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cologne, Germany as a Humboldt Fellow. With immense pleasure and honor, I invite Dr. Vina Vies to share her valuable thoughts. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Sri Lakshmi, for your kind words. Um, I am, it's really my pleasure to be part of this uh, Space Week celebration and to uh, interact with you all. So I will start with uh, sharing my screen. Okay, I hope uh, you are able to see my screen. It is visible. Yeah, thank you. Um, so today, I will talk about the star formation in the Milky Way and observer's guide. So through this presentation, uh, I would like to give you a flavor of uh, 
observational multi-wavelength astronomy uh, in emphasis with the star formation in our galaxy, the Milky Way, without introducing any complex mathematical equations. So uh, through this, if you feel get a feel of what uh, we observational astronomers uh, do in our research, if, if you can get a, at least a small glimpse, I will be more than happy uh, for that. And uh, let us start with the, uh, the night sky. When you look at a clear night uh, to the cosmos, what you see is myriads of stars in the sky like this. And uh, you can, uh, if you observe carefully, you can see that these point-like objects, these bright stars, they come in a slightly different color tone. Some appear as blue, some as green, some as slightly orangish tones. And astronomers try to understand what are these objects? So uh, through the uh, centuries of study, they came to understand that these stars are nothing but uh, uh, the systems or the uh, objects that are similar to our sun, but they come in different classes. And um, astronomers tried to classify them into seven major categories, ranging from O-type stars, with the, which are the most massive stars with a surface temperature of 30,000 Kelvin, uh, and uh, they appear at the blue end of the, say, the visible spectrum, if you, if you color code them. And uh, then at the lower end, there are M-type stars, which are much uh, cooler compared to these massive stars, and they have a, su a surface temperature of 3000 Kelvin. And uh, our sun is just uh, uh, comes in, in between. It's only an intermediate uh, cl class of star with a surface temperature of 6000 Kelvin. So lo looking in the sky for, for centuries, they have also identified some uh, enhancements in, in the stellar concentration towards one particular region. And uh, it has been named as the Milky Way. And now we know that Milky Way is the galaxy we are residing. And all the stars we see in the night sky, they all uh, fall within this single galaxy, in the Milky Way. And people also know that there are numerous galaxies like Milky Way in the universe. And probably you have heard about uh, other this large scale universe in other uh, talks. So Milky Way is a spiral galaxy similar to the Andromeda galaxy, our neighboring galaxy shown in this image. And uh, uh, it has a, a size of approximately 100,000 to 200,000 light years which means that if we want to cross or uh, move from say one end of the galaxy to the other end it will and in the if and if we travel with the speed of light it will take at least 100,000 years to uh, reach the other end and it's such a enormous structure and in within the milky way there are 100 to 400 billion stars present this is the current estimate and um, apart from the stars, the Milky Way also comprises of, uh, uh, in between the stars, the interstellar medium, uh, gas and dust is present. And within the dense regions of this interstellar medium, new stars form. And uh, these are like the nurseries of uh, stars. Uh, shown here is a artistic impression of the Milky Way because uh, we, we reside in the solar system that is within one of the spiral lamps of the Milky Way. So we cannot see a structure like this looking at the sky because we are within the uh, Milky Way. And when we look towards the galactic center region, for example, what we are seeing is a edge on view of the galaxy, which means you are seeing something like this. Uh, and that is what we see here in the image. When we are looking to the sky, we are looking at an edge on view towards the galactic center region, which is in the Sagittarius constellation. So uh, as I told you, the Milky Way galaxy comprises of the stars as well as the interstellar medium and molecular clouds. And they are the raw material for the formation of stars and planets. And uh, these interstellar clouds, they comprise mostly of atomic and molecular hydrogen, uh, not unlike the, uh, the cloud seen in the Earth, because in Earth we have many more uh, rich chemistry and like many more elements present in our clouds. But in the interstellar clouds, the difference is that is mostly of atomic hydrogen and molecular hydrogen. And these clouds are really cold and dark. 
which means they, they have the temperatures of approximately 10 to 30 Kelvin or of or orders of say minus 250 degrees Celsius or below that. Uh, and the star formation in the galaxy, people have tried to understand theoretically how the star is formed within the these molecular clouds. And uh, I have presented here a, a 3D numerical simulation of a massive uh, cloud within uh, say uh, within the galaxy. And uh, this cloud is of order of 20,000 solar mass. And uh, in the simulation, you can see as time progresses, in, in, this is of the order of several million years, the local density enhancements where in this in this enhanced density regions, there is gra uh, gravitational collapse happening and that collapse will uh, turn into like newly formed stars. And these stars, as they contract more and more, they become hotter and hotter. Then they start to emit in the visible light, like, like what we see in the night sky. But as they evolve, they will start to produce more jets and outflows. And uh, they have a lot of stellar wind and radiation. And this will carve out the surrounding molecular cloud and you see this kind of cavities, filaments and this kind of a rich morphology. And as they progress more and more, they, uh, they die as, for example, supernova remnants and these kind of explosions will completely destroy the cloud um, and the cloud is completely dispersed. So uh, this is what people thought theoretically how the stars form, but uh, to get a complete picture, we need to compare the theoretical understanding with the observational uh, results. But this is not as easy as it sounds because a direct comparison of uh, theory on star formation and the observation is highly challenging because all these stars in the initial phases, I, as I mentioned and shown in the simulation, they form within cold and dark molecular clouds. This is one such example uh, of an active star forming region within the Eagle Nebula close to the solar system. And uh, you can see this looks practically like a, a devoid of anything, any activity because it is optical, uh, opaque in optical wavelength. And uh, I, I have also shown here another dark cloud, which is B68 or the firm, famous Bernard 68, or it is also called the Coal Sac Nebula because it looks like a Coal Sac. And you don't see anything within or behind that because uh, this cloud is so dense that uh, the any light in the background or within that cannot penetrate this cloud. So if we want to study the star formation in the optical wavelength bands, it's practically impossible because of this problem, because of the high interstellar extinction. But we know that the electromagnetic spectrum not only comprises of the visible light, and in fact, the visible light constitutes only a slight fraction of this entire range of electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, this comes in wide range of frequencies and wavelength bands. So on the longer wavelength side, you have the radio waves, microwaves, etc. And on the shorter side, we have the ultraviolet X-ray, gamma ray, etc. And uh, people have also uh, understood that uh, the if a body is emitting a particular kind of electromagnetic radiation, this emitting uh, frequency or the wavelength depends strongly on the temperature of the emitting objects. So more hotter and hotter bodies, they emit in the low frequency, uh, high frequency bands, whereas the cooler bodies emit mostly in the low frequency or longer wavelength bands. Um, and apart from this, one more thing I want your uh, attention to is, this is a ba basic high school level physics uh, e equation, which is the Wien's law which means that uh, the peak temperature of the uh, black body, whatever is it is emitting, that peak uh, wavelength is inversely proportional to the temperature of the body. So uh, shown here are three uh, curves, 12,000, 6,000, and 3,000 Kelvin. And you can see that the uh, uh, hottest one, the 12,000 Kelvin, the peak temperature is somewhere here, but the, as we move to the lower temperatures, the peak is shifted. This we all know. And we also know that, uh, see from the figure that uh, 
it's only not only emitting at a very specific wavelength, but it follows a distribution like this, the energy spectrum. And uh, if we see these three uh, temperatures, we, we know that the visible light is not, in fact, the like the peak of, for example, this curve. And visible light is only a small fraction of all this, uh, this entire spectrum. So we know that uh, not only that visible light, when we are like studying the visible optical astronomy, we are probing only a very uh, uh, small fraction of what, what is exactly happening. And we, we get a small uh, uh, information, but um, also maybe in the other wavelengths, there are like completely different uh, mechanisms happening. And uh, to get a complete picture, we definitely need the multi-wavelength studies. Uh, but again, uh, I, I want to mention another challenge in the multi-wavelength astronomy, because if we look at the atmospheric opacity plot of Earth, uh, so this plot basically means that uh, whatever shown in the y-axis is the opacity, which is um, uh, how much uh, the electromagnetic radiation can penetrate the atmosphere of Earth. So we already learned uh, that uh, ozone layer protects uh, us from the harmful X-ray and uh, gamma ray radiation, right? So that is basically shown here in the uh, graph. So towards the shorter wavelength bands or high frequencies, uh, all the incoming radiation is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. Then we have this visible window where uh, almost most uh, all of the incoming radiation can penetrate. So that is why we are able to see all the astrophysical objects in the optical bands uh, from Earth. But then if we move to the infrared uh, part of this plot, we see that, okay, some regions of the infrared, there is transparency or like it is allowing uh, incoming radiation, but some regions there is high um, opacity. This is because uh, some of the infrared radiation is strongly absorbed by the water vapor molecules in the atmosphere. So if people want to study these kind of objects, there is no option other than to look, uh, go to the higher altitudes where uh, water vapor is less and there you can do that. And also I, I forgot to mention that in the high frequency gamma and X-rays, you definitely need satellites because you need to go outside of the Earth's atmosphere if you want to probe the radiation coming from astrophysical objects. Then again, uh, there is this mid and far infrared uh, region where opacity is again really high so that you definitely need something in the space to probe the incoming radiation. But then as we progress towards the longer wavelength bands, the atmosphere is again uh, pay, like allowing to uh, for the incoming radiation. So these are mostly the radio waves. They they can penetrate the uh, Earth's atmosphere. So you, you don't need to go into the space to study the radio uh, signals. Uh, so we know that okay for the multi wavelength astronomy, we need different kind of techniques. Sometimes we need to uh, go for a space telescope. Sometimes we need. Uh, the ground-based observatory. So uh, our um, conventional view of the optic, uh, what a telescope is uh, based on our optical telescope, this has been like, uh, this is not good enough for us. For example, if we look at the high frequency telescopes like the uh, gamma ray telescope it shows here the image of the Fermi, this is a satellite. And uh, the Fermi, um, we have uh, this, bismuth germanite detector. And this detector is essential to detect any gamma ray radiation. So we need those kind of a detector, especially equipped in the satellites for the gamma ray astronomy. Whereas if you go to the X-ray astronomy, so shown here is the famous Chandra X-ray satellite. Uh, so here, the usual optical mirrors you see in the um, normal telescope that is replaced by uh, these kind of mirrors of uh, ceramic or metal, because to detect and deflect the X-rays, incoming X-rays, we really, uh, mirrors cannot do that. So re we really need metallic uh, mirrors, for example. And uh, in the infrared uh, wavelengths, uh, the, the telescopes are almost similar or the techniques are almost similar to what we use in optical, except that they have to be in very high altitudes or in the space. So this Herschel is an infrared telescope in the space and the SOFIA is a 
flying observatory under NASA. So, or even you can observe infrared with the um, telescopes in the mountains, for example, in the Atacama, Chile, uh, uh, then in the Himalaya, we have like Himalayan Chandra telescope, which can observe in the near infrared, etc. But uh, if we move to the longer wavelength bands in the radio, the picture is completely different here. Instead of all these different kinds, we need basically something similar to our TV uh, antennae. So these are like parabolic antenna dishes and uh, we sometimes instead of one, uh, like 30s or 40s of these kind of dishes uh, distributed in a uh, area of say several kilometers are used to probe the, to act as a single telescope and probe the incoming uh, radio uh, emission from the astrophysical objects. Uh, so I don't want to go into detail into the technical aspects of this uh, uh, multi-wavelength astronomy. Instead, I will focus on the scientific aspects. And uh, first, let us show the uh, normal optical image of the Milky Way. Uh, so this is the image uh, taken towards the galactic center region. So we are sitting in the solar system and we are looking towards the galactic center. And you can see this kind of uh, central uh, slight enhancement in the brightness towards the center. And this is where the galactic center is roughly located. And But you can see in the optical, there are these bands or filaments of molecular cloud sitting against this bright background. Mm, and uh, this is practically blocking all the incoming radiation. So we are not able to see what is happening behind these clouds. But this is also in a way kind of blessing to us because uh, if this was not the case, our night sky would also be like as bright as the day sky because galactic center is really bright and the clouds blocking radiation is the only reason why night sky appears as dark. Uh, but if I present you all the multi-wavelength uh, view of the this in inner galaxy taken with different telescopes, the picture is completely different. So you can see that in the gamma ray, instead of this um, dark feature, we now see the emission is uh, more uh, evident. You can see the strong emission coming from the galactic center region because there is this uh, interaction from the center supermassive black hole. And uh, there is also a lot of emission in these regions in the uh, corresponding to, sorry, corresponding to the clouds. So most of these gamma radiation come from sources such as supernova remnants, which are seen as bright blobs here, here. But there, there is also like a diffuse emission, which is the gamma ray emission produced due to the interaction of cosmic rays with the hydrogen in the molecular clouds. That's why you see this diffuse gamma ray uh, radiation. Uh, in the X-ray, the picture is <clears throat> somewhat similar to the optical wavelength band because uh, the X-ray radiation gets strongly absorbed by the molecular clouds in our galaxy. So we can't see much. But if we move to the infrared, we are able to see all the uh, information behind these clouds. And also these clouds, which appeared as dark in the optical also starts to emit significantly in the infrared. Uh, so the reason is, as we know, the infrared, uh, the, the molecular clouds are really cold of the order of few tens of Kelvin. And uh, this uh, is peaking in the uh, infrared or longer wavelength band. So they emit significantly compared to the hotter objects. And in the radio, you can completely, like the, these um, radiation can completely penetrate the molecular clouds and you can see all the information. Again, uh, the galactic center is appearing as like a bright band here. And you also see uh, this radio emission, the synchrotron emission from several supernova remnants and all these high energetic events. So we know that, uh, Although like looking at a one particular band is just um, like a teaser of this entire complete movie. Uh, so before moving into star formation, I would like to also show a quick uh, multi-wavelength view, view of the famous supernova remnant known as the Crab Nebula or the, uh, yes, this is the emission from a dying star. There is a supernova activity happened and uh, uh, the explosion caused uh, some uh, really hot gas within this uh, supernova. And this is of the order of millions of Kelvin. 
So this is 10 power 6 Kelvin. So it peaks in the shorter wavelength band. So you can see that this supernova emits also brightly in the optical wavelength bands. But if you look at the different uh, uh, wavelengths, you see completely different structures or morphologies. So in the gamma ray and X-ray, you can see the central pulsar associated and the emission from the central pulsar uh, associated with this scrap nebulae. But if you look at the ultraviolet infrared and radio, we see mostly the, the diffuse nebulae within the supernova remnant. So uh, this is another view and showing the importance of multi-wavelength observations to study the astrophysical uh, objects. And now I will move on to the star formation part. And uh, there we are looking at uh, uh, the other side of the electromagnetic spectrum, because uh, as I mentioned, these come in more relatively colder uh, regions. And uh, so we need a longer wavelength band because uh, this won't emit uh, much in the shorter band. So using high frequency data is not uh, much uh, use for us. So I would like to bring uh, back your attention towards the B68 or the cold sac nebula I presented in the earlier slide. So shown here is uh, the optical image as well as the combination of optical and infrared image. Uh, so uh, how we make the optical plus infrared image. So in that image, what we did is we have this RGB map. RGB corresponds to this red, green, and blue false color coding. So red and green in this image corresponds to the optical wave bands, whereas, sorry, the blue and green corresponds to the optical bands, whereas red corresponds to the infrared data. So combining these three, we see that whatever dark patch of cloud we see in the optical, this is not really like dark in the infrared. And on the contrary, this emits slightly in the infrared. That is the reason why you see this as a with a reddish tone. The, the same effect which you observe when uh, looking at the sunset, you see a uh, slightly redder emission because all the blue light gets scattered and only the red light is really coming towards us. So we see the reddish uh, sunset. Uh, right. So similarly, here we are seeing that uh, this cloud is really cold, but it is emitting some uh, fraction of radiation in the infrared. So you see this as a, a slightly reddish tone. But apart from that, because of this uh, lower extinction, the objects, the radiation behind the cloud, it can also penetrate the cloud. So that is why we are seeing these uh, point sources or the stars which are behind the cloud also in this image. So this emphasizes again the, uh, the importance of looking at the longer wavelength bands to study the star formation happening within uh, deep within the molecular clouds. Uh, now I will show you another uh, star forming region as an example. So this is called the star forming region G334.24 plus 0.15. So uh, this is named uh, with respect to the sky coordinates. So you see here the optical wavelength band, and uh, I don't think you can make out any like any difference uh, in this. Where is the exactly the star formation happening or anything? Even you are not seeing any molecular cloud. This just appears like a, a, a collection of stars, right? So. Um, here I want to, okay, before mentioning anything, I will show you the other infrared image, slightly longer wavelength band image, and you see that there is a different uh, kind of a, a picture here, right? So whatever you saw here, last, like an uninteresting, uh, just, a, uh, uh, just a, a field of stars, here in the near infrared, it's different. You see a slight nebulosity. We call that as like the diffuse emission or the nebulosity towards uh, this region. I have shown with the, this <clears throat> pointer to show the re relative location. And uh, you also see some kind of dark patches compared to the uh, other region. So this is uh, maybe you may be wondering why you don't see anything like uh, the dark cold sac nebula here, because uh, in this image, you are looking towards the galactic inner galaxy. And in the inner galaxy, there are so many stars in the foreground and back background. So uh, you are seeing all these stars in front of them, which is blocking all the like, you don't see any contrast between the uh, 
you know the background cloud or the foreground stars but in the infrared you can see like compared to other outside regions this part has relatively less concentration of stars which means that there is some kind of cloud sitting there and definitely you are also seeing some kind of emission but uh, to study this further we need information at other wavelength bands and so i bring your attention to slightly longer wavelength band in the mid infrared and here you can get a, see the spectacular image of the star forming region with uh, very interesting intricate features so you see here some bright emission again this i should mention that this is a rgb map the red green blue corresponds to three mid infrared wavelength bands ranging from say 3.6 micron at the blue end and 8 micron at the red end so when you see here some enhanced green emission for example this means that this part is emitting more in the green or that particular wavelength compared to other wavelength bands but again in the infrared also you see this kind of dark patches which are like the real dense parts of the molecular cloud but then you also see some emission like this now moving to the other longer wavelength bands i present here the complete uh, six wave like six band image of this ended star forming region and uh, you can see as you move from shorter to longer wavelength bands you are getting more and more information but not only that all these Im images are completely different from each other right when you are looking at different wavelength bands you are no longer seeing the exact morphology mm, uh, in the near infrared you just see some nebulosity but in the mid infrared you see this kind of rings and with the central bright source and some enhancement but in the far infrared what you can see is where you saw this kind of dark patches they appear really bright here and then in the sub millimeter if you move this central bright region started fading but you also see some kind of these filamentary structures and in the radio this is completely different and you see a like a structure like this which is at a say centimeter wavelength bands now uh, i have presented all these images but how to connect them how to study the star formation so this is also again i should mention that i am presenting here only the very uh, simple or very uh, few few aspects which we study so for example if we look at the near infrared wavelength band what you are really probing is the hot dust of the order of 1000 kelvin you can study with the uh, near infrared then you can also get an idea about the newly like the stars formed in the in this region if there are clusters of stars you can see they will be like uh, concentrated in a particular portion of this region then we can also get an idea about the classes of objects called the young stellar objects or the newly formed stars which are not in the main sequence phase but more in the early evolutionary phase but if you look at the mid infrared band we see a slightly different picture because this mid infrared the diffuse emission corresponds to warm dust of few hundreds of kelvin in contrast to the thousands of kelvin at the near infrared and in the mid infrared you can also get other um, molecules like the uh, complex hydrocarbons in the space you can also get an idea about the silicate dust features in the space etc but again mid infrared also props the young stellar objects and the more early kind of protostellar objects as well so you may be wondering like uh, okay she has presented all these images and say that uh, these are the properties or these aspects can be studied but how astronomers came into this conclusion that this is this and the other one is that for that i show bring back your like attention to the earlier uh, electromagnetic spectrum energy spectrum means law etc so shown here is another uh, uh, the uh, spectral energy distribution uh, and uh, of objects of different temperatures and you can see something ranging from say 100 kelvin to 10000 kelvin and uh, i mentioned that the hot dust corresponds mostly to 1000 kelvin objects and if we look at the near infrared near infrared is of the wavelength uh, ranging say 1 to 2 micron and if we see the 1 to 2 micron 
and the corresponding curve, you can see that the objects with the black body spectrum of 1000 Kelvin, they peak roughly at order of 1000 Kelvin. So from that, we know that, okay, whatever is emitting dominantly in the near infrared, those should have temperatures of the order of few thousands of Kelvin. But if you go to the mid infrared, uh, mid infrared is somewhere close to hundred, uh, say eight to 10 micron. And if we move to that region and we see that mostly the objects emitting and these uh, are peaking at a, uh, temperatures of corresponding to 300 Kelvin or like few hundreds of Kelvin. So this is why I said that when you're looking at the different uh, bands, different wavelengths, you are uh, uh, seeing the emission at a uh, different, different temperature. So it is more similar to you are looking at a different layers of emission. Then if we, for example, pass this light through a spectrograph and look take the spectrum out and see the spectrum will have several peaks like this. And people, what they have done is they have compared these spectra with the laboratory spectroscopic data and they try to analyze, okay, this particular wavelength band, I see an emission peak. And what in the, in the uh, laboratory spectroscopic uh, data, what do I see? What kind of molecule will uh, emit at that frequency? or that wavelength and compare that. And they see that, okay, in the mid infrared, there are several lines of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon molecules. So these are also present in the interstellar medium because you see the peaks corresponding to them. So this is how they study the molecules within the uh, ISM. The next is about the young stellar objects. For these uh, people use mainly a technique called the color color diagram. So in this one, what we do is, uh, you see several stellar point-like objects in these images, right? And we take all the image, these sources, extract the information from them. And uh, since we are looking at different wavelength bands, we have the magnitude information corresponding to different wavelength bands. So for a particular star, you have the magnitude at 3.6, magnitude at 4.5 micron, magnitude at 5.8, 8, et cetera, et cetera. So what you do is take the difference between the magnitude of two bands and then another two bands and then plot them as X versus Y. So these kind of plot, forget about any band, but the general idea is you take the magnitude difference between two bands and then plot them in the X, Y uh, axis. And you see a distribution like this. And uh, the main sequence sources, they will have nearly zero uh, or uh, not much uh, difference in the magnitude uh, in, the, in, in this color color diagrams. Whereas if the uh, sources are young stellar objects or they are like really young sources, what happens is they have a lot of dust around them, right? So the, these sources, since they have a lot of dust around them, this dust will absorb some of the um, radiation from the star, right? And this absorption will depend strongly on the wavelength. So the shorter uh, bands will be absorbed more compared to the longer bands. So depending upon how much dust is present, the um, uh, object can show like a uh, move in the color color diagram towards this, this side. If it is more close to the central zero zero axis here, it is more uh, less evolved or sorry, more evolved. And if you if they move, say, this direction or this direction, which means that there is a lot of dust associated with them and they are less evolved and we are probing the young stellar objects. So uh, the objects uh, see like uh, with an offset really from the main sequence, we can take them, plot them in the plot, uh, these uh, images and see their location and identify the young stellar objects. And moving into the submillimeter band, as I said, they emit at really cold uh, bands to peak in the submillimeter. And this means that they probe mostly the molecular clouds associated with the star forming region. And again, when you do spectroscopic studies, you can clearly see several lines of interstellar molecules such as carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, et cetera. And also, uh, these molecular clouds, uh, they will also show some enhance the clumpy distributions or core-like distributions. And these clumps are fragments 
uh, are the regions where the newly uh, formed stars or stars undergo gravitational collapse and they, they form the stars. Uh, but we also note that the submillimeter, you don't see much uh, stars in the background. Why? Because uh, stars emit mostly in the shorter wavelength bands. And when, when their spectral energy distribution falls drastically before reaching the submillimeter. So you, you don't have much emission from the main sequence stars. So here, mostly the molecular cloud and clumps, which are undergoing collapse. But if you go to the radio bands, uh, I should mention here that this is probing the ionized plasma around massive stars. Because uh, any stars with temperature of order of 10,000 Kelvin or more, they can produce in enough ultraviolet radiation. And this ultraviolet radiation can ionize the surrounding hydrogen cloud. And this will produce a plasma around the, the immediate vicinity of the central star. So these kind of emission indicate that there is already a, some kind of O star or B star formed and that is ionizing that region. So uh, we know that we have different kind of uh, uh, information obtained. And uh, now what we want to do is just combine all this like a p p different pieces of puzzle and get a complete multi-wavelength picture of the star formation activity in a specific region. So for that, what we do is we use all this information, extract everything. Uh, these are the, as mentioned, some of the aspects, but we use all this data, uh, estimate the temperature of the region, density of the region, study the protostellar objects, et cetera, et cetera. So here I show the a picture where I have combined some of these images. So the red corresponds to this uh, far infrared image. The green corresponds to this mid infrared one, one band. And uh, uh, the, you can also see this uh, contour, which corresponds to this radio emission. So combining everything together, you can see that the cold part or the, the red part, red part corresponds to regions of more far infrared or millimeter emission, which means that these are really the regions which are less evolved. They are more the molecular clouds where initial stages of star formation may be happening, but we don't have any like evident signatures. But where you see this kind of enhanced the green emission, that is where you have more hot dust compared to the cold dust. So there is more hot dust. And these are the regions which are likely gets heated up by the stars within them. And the radio, if you see, the, this is concentrated really in a small region here which means that there is some kind of uh, O and B stars formed really within the cloud and that is ionizing. And that ionizing radiation you see here. But if you look just at the visible band, you don't have any information. You, you don't see this complicated picture at all. So which means that we need this kind of an analysis to get the idea. But apart from this um, understanding the temperature and uh, uh, young stellar object population, uh, we can also study the chemical complexity and uh, studying the spectra, you can understand what kind of molecules are formed. And also these molecules are, this is a complete branch of astrochemistry where people try to say, take the abundance, relative abundance of different molecules and try to study them and say like, okay, at this point of evolution, this molecule will be more than the other molecule, for example. So these kind of chemical uh, studies will be also useful to understand the chemical composition as well as the evolution. But then uh, in combining all the information, we can get an idea about what evolutionary stage the, uh, uh, the region is. For example, is it having more young stellar objects or more uh, uh, molecular cloud, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get an idea about the approximate age because getting a, the, the correct age is highly difficult and, uh, but you can at least get an approximate age. So we do these kind of studies towards individual regions, but then combine everything and do a statistical study to get a picture of the region. So to summarize here, um, these observational study of star forming regions are really challenging. So in the optical wavelength bands, there is really high extinction and you don't get much information. You cannot do much with only the optical astronomy. But if you combine multiple wavelength 
the advantage is that you can probe objects in different stages of evolution. So this is like a, you know, you see the different layers of an onion like that. These are the different layers in uh, what we see in the multibands and combining everything, uh, you can uh, get a complete uh, picture of the region. And uh, also the uh, facilities keep on uh, like improving and with the novel observational te techniques, new discoveries keeps on happening and people are getting more and more uh, uh, interesting information about these star forming regions. So with this, I will uh, stop here and thank you very much for uh, your attention and I will be happy to take questions if any. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now we have the interactive session. I invite the program coordinator, Dr. Sachin PC, to coordinate the session. Okay, thank you. I think I'm audible for you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So actually, we have a few questions in the Q and Q and A section. And if anybody is having further question, they can uh, put it in the chat box or in Q and A section. Okay. So we'll try to answer one by one. Okay. The first question is actually not only the first question. All the questions are from Sangeeta S. Yeah. So, uh, ma'am, most of the graphs that I see and study are always mostly arranged in a fashion of principal diagonal elements of a matrix. Why is the plot done uh, in this fashion, ma'am? Uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, regarding which plot Sangeeta is talking about. I is... don't understand. Yeah, is, is she mentioning some talk in this? Yeah, Sangeeta, can you first graph, it seems. Sangeeta, if you want to... Uh, speak directly, you can just uh, uh, put the hand raise option. We can enable the mic for you to speak directly. Main sequence. Yeah. I think. Plot maybe. Is, is she mentioning this one? Yeah, the first, first graph, I think. Uh, but what, what exactly is the question? Can you repeat again? I'm sorry. Uh, she's asking about something. Uh, maybe maybe we'll uh, give her the permission to mm -hmm. ask the question directly. Yeah, Sangeeta, you can ask now. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, actually, ma'am, in the first graph, like mm -hmm. whatever type of plots we see, it's always in kind of like a, a matrix format only, like in the principal diagonal elements. Like how are, how is this plot actually done? That is my doubt. Actually, why is it arranged in this fashion? Is it based on due to the color distribution? Uh, so uh, yes. So if you are talking about this particular graph, what we are uh, seeing is in the x-axis, we are uh, this uh, scales are represented from say the hottest to the less hot. So the inverse that uh, nature in the reverse order. So the uh, hottest objects are in the uh, leftmost side of the graph, whereas the uh, uh, cooler ones are towards the right. Mm -hmm. And in the top panel, it's more like a brightness also, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, less bright is on the lower part, whereas the brighter one is in the upper part. So these, these are like the typical HR diagrams, if you heard oh, of yes, it. Yes, ma yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, typically represented like this. and. This is just a, a, a simplistic um, graph of representing the real HR diagram, but this is not the real HR diagram, but this is much more simpler. Okay, okay. got it. Okay, another question is actually how the dark cloud is formed, the cloud that you're talking about, how they are formed. Okay, these, these are like in the early epochs, you have the Big Bang explosion, but then after that, uh, uh, you have many um, uh, atoms formed, mostly the hydrogen and helium, and then this hydrogen fuse, undergo fusion to form, say, molecular hydrogen, and uh, also you have helium, but then later, I, I don't exact, so for 
my knowledge about uh, also the density and, and anomalies in the early universe is not complete, but what I know is that we also see this evidence in the CMB radiation, for example. So there were some kind of uh, density fluctuations and these fluctuation caused, um, you know, gravitational collapse of certain large scale structures and the uniform cloud uh, or the uniform radi this entire matter that formed the smaller uh, structures and they developed to form galaxies, right, as we know. And uh, these are uh, initially the whatever we are seeing right now are not the primordial clouds, but uh, these are more uh, clouds that has undergone multiple cycles of star formation activity. So you have initially the uh, first uh, molecular clouds in the universe, but then these clouds undergo gravitational collapse, they form stars, then these stars will, uh, you know, like uh, disperse all the clouds around them. But after uh, several millions of years, the star will explode and uh, form supernova remnants or uh, they will uh, uh, also shed layers. When they are uh, in, in the end stages, they will expand and they shed layers. All this will, uh, what, we, what will happen is all this will expel a lot of uh, circumstellar material into the, me, uh, the ambient region. And this will distribute again the matter into the, the vacuum. And this matter will again slowly start to you know, move around and form some density in, in homogeneities and within them again the second generation of stars form. So these undergo multiple generations like this. They form, they uh, 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 expand, they explode, then they again from that material new stars form. This continues forever until it, it is until so i should also mention that until there is not enough hydrogen to form new stars so that those kind of regions uh, you don't see much star formation like in elliptical galaxies where most of the uh, material has been used to form stars and the 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 uh, ism itself has like a very high metallicity and you don't no longer form stars because you cannot uh, fuse these heavy elements. You don't have enough uh, temperature to, you know, energy to uh, fuse this, so they don't form stars anymore. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is actually based on the death of stars. So mm -hmm. uh, do the uh, all stars follow the same track of uh, a supernova explosion, or is there any difference? No. The, the uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is there any depends on temperature? I mean, temperature or mass, which one is uh, more dependent? This is a question. Yeah, so yes. th this depends on the, obviously the mass, but mass uh, also it has a temperature dependence because I will say that the massive stars are more hotter also. And uh, uh, this, ma um, you may have heard about the Chandrasekhar limit. So the supernova explosion happens if you, Oh, the star is say uh, the mass greater than 1.44 times the solar mass, they, they will undergo supernova explosion. If that is not the case, they will uh, form more uh, white dwarfs. Like they don't have this kind of violent explosion. Instead, e even in this brown dwarf, uh, stars undergoing brown dwarf, they will also shed their layers, but not as like a high energetic explosive events like supernovae. And if the mass of this um, star is above the three solar mass range, it will form a black hole. This is the current theoretical understanding. Okay, so there is one another question. Uh, is any, I think the question is like this, is there any uh, dark region on the sky? Uh, the, uh, the, do they correspond to a dark cloud? Mm. Yeah, well, so in the night sky, typically when you see this kind of a dark patches, they usually correspond to um, molecular clouds. But there are also uh, voids seen in some specific region of the galaxies. It's not only from optical, but you, if you see in the other bands also, you see that there is some kind of cavities. And these kind of dark cavities can be formed uh, if there is some kind of violent activity happened and uh, th that will completely wipe out anything within them. In, in fact, there is a recent uh, discovery of some kind of void 
in the milky way uh, i think uh, caused by some kind of supernova activity yeah region with less star formation and so the number of stars are less yeah. yes. like that yeah. yes so uh, the next question is also specific to some plot i think mm -hmm. sangeeta can ask the question directly uh, ma'am actually in that uh, scatter plot which you had uh, shown about the green circle uh, the red circle yeah actually in this uh, as you mentioned the green circle is the region which shows that there is a dark or uh, is there is a presence of uh, dark cloud is that what it this represents no no the, so this i have just marked with the circles to show that these are approximately the uh, uh, regions in this specific color color diagram where whatever object falling in that region likely is a young stellar object they are not clouds they are point sources because we are only taking the stars seen in the images and you are just plotting the magnitude information of these stars on these plots and if you see that uh, the main sequence stars will fall in the particular part of this color color diagram and the young stars they will have a slightly uh, offset with respect to the region where main stars are located because those stars the young stars their uh, uh, radiation is slightly different from that of the main sequence this is delineating the main sequence and young stars okay 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 another question is from uh, nandulal Ma'am, can you say uh, more about how we can find the age of a star? Age of a star, yeah. So, age of a star, as I said, one way is uh, if you want to observe stars that are really young, we, we, just checking the image like this, you cannot get any information, right? Because you are seeing some bright spots. But if you take the stars and plotting a color color like diagram like this or there are color magnitude diagrams so in the x have uh, one wave length minus the other wave magnitude and the y axis one wave this kind of different plots they are we all represent in a way the hr diagram so if you see the um, hr diagram of this kind of stars you get in the uh, in relation to where they fall in this all different kind of graphs you can get an idea about what uh, kind of uh, phase it is in but this is one way the other way is you have to uh, look at the spectroscopic data if you take the spect uh, spectrum of a star and you can see several lines so main sequence stars if it is a massive star for example you see lot of hydrogen lines and helium lines because massive stars can really ionize these things but if it is a lama star you don't see these lines but you see some other lines so studying the spectral signature studying the color color diagram all this will give you an uh, idea about the uh, age of this particular star this is how you usually people do it okay uh, so uh, that's all the questions in the q and a section and um, I think I have to ask uh, one to Christian because, yeah, uh, one is actually you have shown initially uh, mm -hmm. a plot which is showing the opacity of the uh, atmosphere. Yeah. So in that, uh, uh, optical band is actually open uh, for radiation. Yes. So basically, we need to have an access. Uh, uh, we have the access to the optical radiation from the ground itself. So, yes. is there any need to go uh, into the space when you observe in optical, just like uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which is having... Yes. So, so, here, one more thing I didn't mention is, though we can observe the optical light from the ground, this is just based on like the incoming radiation, whether it can penetrate or not. But another thing, when you uh, uh, look at the, like, the optical band, this is the quality of the image. So when you are within like the lower uh, atmosphere or we are in the ground based system, many times you have like lot of, uh, you know, thick atmosphere within, right? And the stellar light can get diffracted and you see like the diffracted uh, thing in the, when you look through the telescope. 
so if the atmospheric condition is really bad and th- when there are like lot of you know weather activity the temperature difference between different layers of the atmosphere that can uh, basically like refract refraction will happen and this refraction will uh, take the starlight to bend in slightly different uh different ways depending on different layers and ultimately the image you get will be this uh, refraction limited image so th- there uh, the quality of your image will be bad but if you go to the space you do no longer have atmosphere so you, you don't need to like uh, you know account for this particular problem so uh, in the t- space you get a much more high quality image compared to what we see from the ground okay so one. yeah one more question that i have is uh, regarding the shape of the star so mm-hmm. all the stars that you are uh, putting on your images are not mm-hmm. actually in spherical shape ah uh-huh. yeah okay yeah, it is having some like you are seeing some kind of this yeah. kind of leg like thing so so this comes from the telescope itself so these are like the uh, you know uh, effects of the telescope and also as i said there are some we see all this they have some kind of blurring effect right they are not perfect point source you see some elongation this is also due to them being in the ground so uh, i mean for example in the optical but in the infrared where you see this kind of Uh, things are due to artifacts caused by the telescope itself okay uh, so that's all the questions that we have if anybody else want to ask questions they can have a hand raise option just enable the hand raise option and ask the question directly okay there is no further questions i think Thanks, okay so we can uh, stop the session here thank you sir thank you so much veena ma'am for such a wonderful session now i invite mr hari govind to propose the vote of thanks Hello. So I am audible. Yeah, you are audible. Speak. Here. You are audible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, all of us are uh, physics aspirants. As we all know, uh, physics aspirants are always excited to understand uh, mysteries of cosmos. Uh, it is a great pleasure. to all of us to be a part of such great section so i hari govin jr a uh, student uh, on behalf of all participants wanted to thank dr veena vs madam to giving us such a wonderful and inspiring session i also have to thank uh, our head of physics department dr sheena miss and uh, also uh, our bensa Dr. Ben Baju sir, uh, for uh, a great welcome speech, and heartily I'm thanking all the participants who give uh, their attention to uh, to this program, especially for some of those students uh, who go deep into the session and ask a lot of questions. I thanking all of them and just continue this uh, kind of uh, spirit all of your career. Thank you. thank you that brings us to the end of the program thank you all for your valuable time and attention kindly feel free free to share your feedback thank you once again and have a great evening uh thank you very much veena thank you thanks so the feedback form is posted here uh, or it will be posted in the uh, telegram group also you can fill the feedback form and submit it